Once Jennifer Goldson got you the script to read, how much time passed before you finally read it and then finally said okay to it? That's a wonderful question because I don't think that Bethany, uh, Joe Gamash, who's one of my other producers, and Will even could have believed that I believe we bought the property in like our October and we were in pre-production in January and we shot the movie in August or September or something. Uh, it's just unheard of. But, you know, that's the way I work. And the outcome of it is, is at this rate, we can produce a movie every couple of years and in success, use the, the moderate success of, of these movies to finance the next movie. Are you okay with talking about what the next steps were once you all agreed that we really love this film and we think we can do it for a reasonable budget? What were some of the next things you did to actually secure the deal? Well, once we made a deal with the screenwriter, you, you basically option the script. You pay a certain amount of money, and thus that gives you the comfort of writing the script, uh, modifying the script, and then actually making the decision to green light it. That happened in, in just a few months for me on this movie uh, versus buying a script off the shelf, spending two years in pre-production, <laughs> and then actually going out and shooting it, um, there's so many, there's so much equity in experience here. Because first timers, including myself, you make a lot of mistakes. And I just mentioned one of them. I mean, we just got a bill for the last movie from SAG that was unaffordable. And the movie hasn't even, I don't want to, I don't want to complain about it, but the movie hasn't even you know, broken even, and we're getting bills from SAG for residuals, and the movie never came out of theaters. I'm not complaining right now. What I'm trying to say is I'd never anticipated that. So for my next film, I'll have to put away funds rather than having to borrow funds in order to pay for the, my last movie, SAG, because the way the financials work in independent filmmaking, if you're lucky enough to get a distributor, and I mean that honestly, because there's so much of a flood of independent filmmaking now. If you're in, uh, lucky enough to get an in, uh, independent uh, uh, distributor, you have one thing conquered. But what you don't have is the concept of how Hollywood works. You know, first, uh, you're the last person to get paid. And that in itself is uh, troubling because I financed the movie myself. I can't even conceptualize what it must feel like and I do know somebody recently who made a movie and I, I believe Netflix wanted to buy it for a substantial amount of money and uh, but not enough to break even and and uh, the filmmaker had no choice in the matter because he was a hired hand even though he directed the movie and produced it all the money was borrowed and he really you know had to acquiesce to the sale and the, I don't think the movie's ever broken even, and he doesn't even talk to the people that he borrowed the money from. And this is not a negative or a positive, it's just an observation of just how, you know, um, perception reality. I had a guy yesterday tell me, wow, your movie just came out, yesterday it came out. And he goes, are you gonna buy a new house? And I'm going, <laughs> w w you read People Magazine, you know? <laughs> and I don't mean that as a joke, because it's the first thing you see in the news, Star Wars made X amount of money. No one, including myself, has any context to understanding what that means. And the outcome of it is, is that, you know, I think it's pretty critical to understand that the business is changing. My last film and this film, it's totally different. We, we didn't have a distributor when we did the first movie. We had a sales rep. And then he in turn sold it to Fox. He in turn sold it to Sony domestically. And it's not a question of good or bad, it's just a question of understanding. And this time around, rather than sell it internationally first, we s did what most people do, which I didn't know. We sold domestically first, you know. And now we're selling Europe and all the other territories. So we're doing it probably a much better way now than we did the first time. I wanted to go back to what you said about putting away reserves. You know, I've heard this with people that have business issues with payroll taxes, different things. I don't think people realize the, the value of reserves or saving yourself. Right. 
Well, I'll, I'll, I'll kill two birds with one stone here because I know you're going to talk about tax credits, and I'll also talk about the question you just asked me. I don't think you can ever really be too prepared <laughs> for how much money this stuff all costs. It is uh, um, an extraordinary thing that I made uh, two movies now with a non-union crew. Am I bragging about it? Not at all. But it made me afford to do the movie. I couldn't have done the movie, my first movie, if it was a sanctioned union movie. This is independent filmmaking, you know. When you, uh, I just saw a movie the other night that was all shot on an iPhone of people traveling from, from Syria to, uh, to Berlin at a film festival. It was brilliant. All shot on an iPhone. And, uh, and I'm sure it's all of his family members. So he doesn't have the burden of the stuff I'm talking about. I actually make movies and I'm a signature to SAG. So I want the best talent I can get to make these movies. But with that comes a lot of little surprises, you know, and they're not surprises by deception, they're just ignorance. And as a filmmaker and a producer, yeah, I, I, and, and as the world changes, you know, monthly <laughs> in, in this business, I can tell you right now, most distributors uh, that distribute independent properties that existed three years ago, half of them don't exist anymore because it's just not, the business model's changed. And when I made my last movie, DVDs were actually an, an interesting proposition. Now it's a fragment. So constantly it's changing.